Chairman, I can confirm that the live stream has now started. OK, and many thanks for that, Steve. Um, good morning and welcome to everyone uh, to the quarterly meeting of Cornwall IFCA. Um, I'll first of all kick off with the uh, meeting protocol, just in case uh, you're not familiar with it. Um, today's meeting is being live streamed, as Steve just said, to the public via Microsoft Teams and is also being recorded. Uh, may I remind members and officers to introduce yourselves each time you speak and turn your video and microphone off when you finish speaking. If the council's live stream fails during the meeting and we cannot share the proceedings, I will adjourn the meeting so that access can be restored. If the issue cannot be resolved, I'll halt the meeting and the remaining business will be, have to be concluded at a future date. If a member experiences a technical issue, I will adjourn for a short period of time to try and re-establish their connection. Members wishing to speak or to ask questions should indicate by typing X in the chat box. Either I or others will pick it up. Um, as I call members to speak, I will remind you to switch on your microphones. If for some reason you cannot be heard, the democratic officer will advise you. Votes will be taken using a roll call procedure. The democratic officer will read out the recommendation and the name of the proposer and seconder, and when they will call on each committee member's name in turn. You should confirm your name and advise whether you vote in favour or against the recommendation or whether you wish to abstain from the vote. The Democratic officer will then count the votes and advise the results accordingly. Where a member has declared a non-registrable interest, a disclosable pecuniary interest or an interest by virtue of any trade union membership in a the matter, they must leave the virtual meeting. Their departure will be confirmed and they will be invited to rejoin the meeting at the appropriate time. I plan to, I, I may call a 10 minute comfort break if necessary, but we'll try and avoid breaking uh, mid agenda item. If the meeting continues any longer uh, than another hour after that, I will look to having a second break. Before we start today's business, I will ask Emma Richards, the Democratic Officer, to confirm members and officers' attendance. Emma. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Thanks very much. Uh, so to confirm everyone's here, um, I'm going to read out everyone's name. Could you uh, confirm you're in attendance and state your name back to me, please? Uh, Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown? Yeah, apologies, a technical Sorry. error. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, welcome. Uh, Councillor Jeff Brown, uh, Cabinet Member for Transport and I represent UK Central. Thank you. Victoria Hobson. Yep, I'm here, Victoria Hobson. Thank you. Councillor Kazmarek. Uh, Councillor Mark Kazmarek. Um, yeah, I'm here, all present. Thank you. Councillor Knightley. Yes, Councillor Knightley here, uh, Cornwall Council representing Weybridge East. Thank you. Carly Elson. Yep, Carly Elson, Principal Marine Officer representing the Marine Management Organisation. Thank you. Sangeeta McNair. Yeah, thank you, Emma. Sangeeta McNair, Senior Marine Advisor um, representing Natural England. Thank you. Celia Mitchell. Yep, Celia Mitchell, MMO Rep. Thank you. John Mundy. John Mundy, MMO appointee, present. Thank you. Tony Tomlinson. Uh, present, MMO appointee. Thank you. Uh, Nick Tregenza. MMO, uh, Nick Tregenza, MMO appointee present. Thank you. Ruth Williams. Hello, Ruth Williams, um, MMO appointee. Thank you very much. Um, I can also confirm the officers present, Chairman. Um, we have Samantha Davis, uh, SIFCA Chief Officer, Simon Cabin, Principal Enforcement Officer, and Colin Trundle, Principal Scientific Officer. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much for that, Emma. Um, we'll move on to the agenda now. Somebody has their microphone on. <laughs> OK, thank you. Right, first of all, Chairman's announcements. Um, I'd just like to make a, a pretty personal uh, tribute to David Muirhead, who's recently passed on, as you all well know. Um, from my perspective, I first met David in 1976, I believe, in Falmouth Bay uh, during the big mackerel fishery. 
I was fishing in the, the original Britannia, an 18 foot open cove boat with Ollie Oller Enshaw, who sadly passed away last month as yeah. well. Uh, <laughs> somebody is still not muted. Well, fishing was good anyway, and we'd almost filled the boat, but the wind had freshened considerably and was blowing a northwesterly gale as darkness approached and our mizzen sail blew out. Then the engine stopped and even the hand pump became blocked. As we were drifting rapidly offshore in the wind, we sent up flares and after what seemed a long time, a large white boat emerged from the darkness. It was the Bella Lane and David Muirhead was in the um, wheelhouse. He came out, looked down on us and calmly asked us if we'd like a tow home. Over the following years, he encouraged me to join the Cornwall Sea Fisheries Committee, where he set a very fine example of concern and enthusiasm for fishing in the marine environment. He also carried his calm and constructive manner to the national body as first vice chairman and then became chairman of the Association of English Sea Fisheries Committees. And I've had many calls from around the country expressing sadness at his loss. As many people know, he was known for rugby, playing for Falmouth and representing Cornwall. He even made a comeback in his 40s with my local side, Roseland, when they were short of players. And again in sailing, uh, well known throughout the sailing world, particularly the Falmouth working boats, where he was renowned for leading the post sailing singing with a very fine voice. One of his true delights was singing on a Friday night at Cadwick Cove Inn with a pint in his head. He was passionate about sustainable inshore fishing and knew the men from coves and harbours in the county well and will be sorely missed by them and all who knew him. A Cornishman to his fingertips, respected by all. Chairman, your microphone's muted. Oh my gosh, that was me. I need to say it again, do I? <laughs> It was only uh, for a few seconds. OK, thank you. Uh, my final sentence, which I uh, mean sincerely, is that he is, was a great Cornishman to his fingertips, respected by all, and I shall remember him with great affection. Right, moving on, I have a message from Tony Berry, who this would have been his final meeting, could he have made it? Uh, his, his message was, my final apologies, please, and my very best wishes to all those members and officers going forward who I've had the privilege of working with over the past many years, not only on the IFCA, but on the old Sea Fisheries Committee. Good luck to all. I should also say at this moment in time, this is Nick Tregenza's last meeting. Uh, and I thank Nick sincerely for his many years of service and his enthusiasm for this and his contribution. Thank you, Nick. Um, finally, one last piece I would like to um, share the news. I, I think every, everyone would know it's a pleasure to see Cadgeworth have reached their target of £300,000. I think it's a tribute to the fishermen and to the um, community itself in Cadgeworth that they raised such a sum of money in such a time to preserve the way of life in Cadgeworth. Right, apologies for absence. We've um, got Emma. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we've got apologies uh, for absence from Tony Berry, Councillor Buscombe, Councillor Regerton and Andrew Pascoe. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Right, declarations of interest. Uh, if um, members would declare any interest on today's agenda as and when it might arise. Um, if there's none there, we'll move on to item three, which the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of December. And if I can go through the um, get the minutes page by page for accuracy. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, six, seven, eight. Tony? Yeah. Sorry, a um, couple of issues from me on page page eight of the, the um, agenda pack, page yep. five of the minutes. Um, right at the bottom, uh, three paragraphs up from the bottom, um, it says alternatives were being considered in relation to marine protected areas. I'm not sure that's, that's what is meant. I think it's meant to be vessel tracking systems. 
Thank you, Ruth. We can change that if you want, happy. Okay. Yes, that Chairman, that is correct. Thank, Thank you. you. And Bye. and the the paragraph just under that, um, where all sea grasses were conservation features. Can we just add of MPAs, please? MPAs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll continue in the in the in the vein of um, the page numbers actually that Ruth has done. I'm going to avoid confusion. Thank you. So on to page nine, page ten, page eleven. Yeah, I, I yeah, Tony, it's Simon, Tom's. I've got Oops, something on page ten. It's section five of the discussion relating to bass, and it was just to clarify that. A member commented that it was important to rely on bass, IC's bass stock assessment when considering bass stock status and whether a summary of that IC's advice could be provided by IFCA officers to members. Thank you, Mr. Toms. OK. On page 11. Page 12. Nope. Oh, we're done. OK, it, thanks. OK, would somebody like to propose, and I'll hand over to Emma here, the adoption. Councillor Kasmarek proposing. Yes, I'm happy to propose it. Um, just, just to say, if members can turn their uh, cameras off, uh, Councillor Code, you still got your camera on? Uh, so I, I'm happy to propose this, Chairman. Thank you. Do we have a seconder, please? Yeah, I'll second. That's Ruth Williams. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs> Great, you happy for me to take the vote, Chairman? Please do. Thank you. Uh, I'll, no, I'll now call out committee members' names in turn. Uh, please confirm your name and advise whether you vote in favour or against the recommendation or whether you wish to abstain from the vote. I'll then count the votes and advise of the result. Uh, Councillor Brown. Uh, Jeff Brown, uh, abstain. I wasn't present at the meeting. Thank you. Councillor Code. Four. Victoria Hobson. Four. Councillor Kazmarek. Four. Councillor Knightley. <clears throat> I need to abstain. I wasn't present at the meeting. Thank you. Carly Elson. <laughs> Thank you. Sangeeta McNair. Sangeeta McNair in favour. Thank you. Celia Mitchell. Four. Thank you. John Mundy. John Mundy in favour. Thank you. Councillor Musto. I think Councillor Musto has been having some trouble with his microphone, Chairman. Um, Councillor Musto, Musto, could you um, type uh, in the chat box if you're in favour of the minutes? I think we'll have to move on from there, Chairman. Okay. Um, uh, yourself, Chairman, Tony Tomlinson. Four. Thank you. Simon Toms. Four. Thank you. Nick Tregenza. Four. Thank you. Ruth Williams. Four. Thank you. Be one moment. That's ten in favour with two abstentions. Thank you, Chairman. That's carried. OK, thank you, Emma. Um, we'll move on to item four. Uh, could we have questions from the public? Um, a period of 15 minutes is allocated for this. Five public questions have been received. If it's not possible for all five questions to be heard at the time, uh, written answers, it will be provided to the questioner and copied to all committee members after the meeting. And the questions are being put in the order they were received. Question one, uh, a member uh, from Mr. Bradley from Probus. At the uh, recent Angling Trust Sea Angling Forum, Sam Davis said that a bass percentage of catch restriction for netting in Cornwall could do one of two things. Either people then start discarding high grading or in order to make up the 75% to match against the 30%, they actually have to put more gear in the water to have fish to make up the 100% in total. Will Cornwall Ifka give further consideration to a percentage of bycatch restrictions being given that 
A, percentage of catch restrictions have been used extensively in EU fisheries management to limit the amount of bycatch in netting fisheries. B, a restriction that results in discarding is not a bad thing provided it achieves lower more overall mortality. Fisheries managers do not refrain from setting quota limits just because they might result in some discarding. C, it would be very difficult for a netter to catch more fish such that those additional fish represented 70% of the total catch, particularly since the quantity of extra fish needed would only be known once the net with the bass had been hauled. Uh, the answer from Cornwall um, IFCA is as follows. Uh, future management will need to consider all types of input and output harvest controls to address this complicated issue. Question two um, from Mr. Colick of uh, Red Ruth, who I believe is joining the um, uh, meeting. Uh, Cornwall IFCA agenda papers and minutes make repeated reference to alleged economic losses to netting vessels should proposed salmonid protection measures be implemented. Does Cornwall IFCA agree that at low water, a typical 30 mesh deep fixed net could continue to be deployed up to the six metre contour and a 50 mesh deep net up to the eight metre depth contour while remaining compliant with having three metres of water over headline. Uh, and the answer from Cornwall IFCA is not necessarily as this would depend upon the mesh size of the net, its headline buoyancy and how it is set in the water. In this case, if it assumes 100 mil mesh, it could be possible to do so. Uh, and I believe, Mr. Colick, you have a supplementary question. Um, Emma, do we do have Mr. Colick online? I'm just checking, Chairman. Just one moment. Chairman, it's Steve, the producer. I, I spoke to Mr. Colick and I saw him join the meeting about five or six minutes ago. I thought he was he was in. Um, also, Mr. Osborne um, has joined as well. I, I believe both the public speakers should have been in. I can yeah. see Mr. Hello. Neil Osborne. Hello. Um, I can see Mr. Colleague has joined the meeting, but the microphone is showing that it's muted. Um, I can't actually unmute from here. I, I can mute, but I can't unmute. Um, Mr. Colleague, have you got your uh, speakerphone turned off? Chairman, it's the producer again. Would it be worth moving on to Mr. Osborne, who is on the line? Um, and maybe I'll, I'll give um, Mr. Colick a call in the background and see if we can get him to rejoin the meeting. OK, I will move to question four then. Come back to question three shortly. Uh, Mr. Osborne, are you with us? I, I am, if you can hear me. I can hear you quite clearly. Thank you very much. Jolly, jolly good. <clears throat> Do you want me to put the question? Yes, please, if you would. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, the report to the committee meeting on the 19th of March 2021 says the recently developed data sharing agreement with the MMO should allow access for Cornwall IFCA to all landing data, including for bass. Please note the words all landings data. The report also says we will develop protocols and procedures under the data sharing agreements which are now in place for the MMO to enable our access in time to key data sets collected by the MMO. So the question I've got to that is really what date is Cornwall IFCA targeting to have access to all landings data from the MMO? OK, thank you for that, Mr. Osborne. Uh, the, the immediate answer is whilst we would like to access, uh, we'd like access to data as quickly as possible, the protocols and procedures referred to in the question need to be developed by the MMO in conjunction with all 10 IFCAs, as there are issues which need to be resolved and training put in place to ensure that data sharing procedures are compliant with relevant legislation. We do not have a date for completion of this work. Uh, I believe you have a supplementary question. Yes, I, I do. The minutes of the last committee meeting say the data sharing agreement with the MMO has been signed and Cornwall IFCA is awaiting confirmation of the process for accessing the information as there will be limitations on the data sets which the MMO will legally be allowed to share. What data sets will Cornwall IFCA not be able to obtain from the MMO and why? 
Uh, I'll pass you over to our chief chief officer for this answer on this one. Thank you. Sam. Thank you very much. Hello, Mr. Osborne. Um, the data, best way to sort of think about the data sharing agreement is that it is there to remove obstacles to sharing, but it doesn't allow us sort of complete access to everything that um, the data that the MMO holds or vice versa. So I think some of the restrictions may come around things like very sort of personal and sensitive data, um, uh, information relating to things like case files, prosecutions. Um, and whilst we will have a sharing agreement, we're still bound by things like the General Data Protection Regulations, Freedom of Information, Data Protection Act. So those um, parameters will still cover the sharing of this information. The other two things we have to consider are um, data minimization. So you can't ask for all the data on everything. It has to be um, confined to what you actually need. And also um, something called stated purpose, where my understanding is I could ask for, say, scalloping data for Falmouth, but I couldn't ask for it for Shoreham because Shoreham isn't within our district. So, um, so there will be quite a bit of work to ascertain which data sets we can have and which might be more restricted. Um, and in some cases, um, there may be um, areas that we can't see. I hope that answers your question. If I can make a comment or sort of just slightly expand on that. I think most of what you said doesn't actually refer to landings data. So uh, within Cornwall Ithaca district. So, um, so landings data you should be able to get. It would be my understanding that landings data will be one of the data sets that we should be able to look at in time. But um, in terms of the process of setting up those procedures and protocols, the MMO have um, indicated they would like to step through a process looking at all the different data sets, applying these tests about um, data minimization and um, eventually enabling us to uh, to see the information that we're most looking for. So, so yeah. So agreeing so, the whole, whole package. I'm afraid time, we're, we're a bit tight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, okay. Mr. Colick is uh, in the meeting now, I believe. Right. Yes, I'm here. Yes, Mr. Colick. Right. Um, my supplementary question is, if so, alleged negative economic impacts can therefore only be based on being denied access to those areas within the proposed restricted areas which are also inside the six or eight meter contours. Which species of consultees claim they would be not denied access to that are captured from such close to shore waters that would lead to hundreds of businesses being at risk? Sam, would you like to answer that one? Sam Davis. Hello, Brian. Um, Hello, Sam. Thanks for the thanks for the supplementary question. Um, the responses we had from the informal consultation um, refer to species like uh, mackerel, bass, grey mullet, red mullet, pollock, whiting, and bream as those species that um, consultees felt they might not have access to. Right here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to hear your voice. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Connick. Um, on to back to question three from Mr. Leighty of Truro. Given the salmon, uh, salmon protection by law, it is likely to come into force in the second half of 2021-22 financial year at the very earliest. Do Cornwall IFCA committee members think it is appropriate that Cornwall IFCA is currently not enforcing the 2010 fixed engine bylaw intended to protect salmonids? based purely on verbal legal advice and will they ask the officers to obtain written legal advice on the matter so that committee members can properly consider the matter. In my opinion, a decision not to enforce the law is a very serious matter and should not be based merely on verbal legal advice without any record of that advice being made by Cornwall IFCA or shared with the committee. Uh, and the answer from Cornwall IFCA is as follows. The chief officer has delegated authority to take legal proceedings based upon legal advice. 
on behalf of the authority. These are operational matters and cannot be discussed by members of the authority in a public meeting. Any legal advice, written or verbal, is privileged and decisions based upon it are taken very seriously by officers as part of their statutory duties. The advice received indicated that it was unsafe to take legal proceedings under this bylaw and therefore officers had a duty to act accordingly. Right, we now then move on to question five from Mr Gilbert of St Ives, uh, headed bylaw for protection of salmonids. Development of a bylaw for protection of salmonids has focused heavily on potential negative economic impacts that proposed restrictions may have on commercial exploitation of other sea fish. It appears, however, that the positive economic impact associated with recreational exploitation of other sea fish as a result of proposed restrictions are simultaneously being ignored. Will the Cornwall IFCA explain why economic impacts of one stakeholder activity are under scrutiny while economic impacts on another stakeholder activity are not being considered? And the answer from Cornwall IFCA is as follows. The purpose of this bylaw is to minimise the incidental capture of salmonids in nets set for sea fish. As a result, the impact assessment has to present information on the cumulative economic impact to those businesses whose activities would be restricted by measures in the proposed bylaw. The positive benefits of the bylaw should be accrued by the salmonid stocks and by those who target them. Those economic benefits have been included where they have been provided to us. Where there are incidental benefits to sea fish, they are not material to the central purpose of the bylaw. And that brings to an end the questions from the public. Right, we move now to item five on your agenda, the budget monitor report. Uh, this one is for Sam, I believe. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, the, unfortunately today, the first of many, many reports with me. Um, hello, members. Nice to see everybody today. Um, the uh, normal quarterly uh, budget monitor here um, and our current budget profile is uh, 1 million 76,385 uh, against a profile budget of 1 million 57,629. So we're carrying a slight adverse uh, variance um, at the moment and this was mainly due to a couple of factors um, partly COVID related. So we have some direct COVID expenditure in terms of changing the ways that we've been working and PPE um, and I'm sure this is uh, familiar to, to lots of parts of the council and indeed to lots of organisations. We also had some additional expenditure on the refits of Avalon and um, St Pirin and Lioness that went through their refit during this period um, and again Covid caused, caused some delays there. So on other um, parts of the budget, we are looking at being underspent, but um, yeah, we're going to come in fairly close this year. Um, in terms of administration, we are currently underspent there and that's mainly due to um, delay in external legal expenses and also because of working this way, we're not, um, we're not traveling around and using um, some of the, the parts of that budget. The enforcement does have an unfavorable variance um, associated with it, as I said, with relation to the work that's been done on uh, the ribs and on St Piran. We had some, some unexpected work done on, on Avalon in a case where um, the further you looked, uh, the more problems um, came to light. And obviously it's essential that all of those vessels are working um, and ready for operation when we need them. Um, in terms of research, there's a small variable variance at the moment, um, but uh, towards the end of the year that will be used for um, some additional equipment that uh, we need for Tiger Lily. Um, moving down on page 14, um, prosecution income, uh, that's quite low at the moment against the profile estimate that we would have in place. Uh, we've got a number of legal issues around the, the payment of prosecution income where uh, we are, as we say, um, the payments from defendants' benefits are paid to other bodies rather than ourselves. We have to wait our turn. So 
eventually we will get that money back, but not at the moment. Um, a reserves position is uh, there in the papers, and I'm very happy, obviously, to take any questions from members. Thank you. Right, does anyone have any questions for Sam? Like right, Jeff? Yeah, thank you, Sam. Very comprehensive report, much appreciated. Um, does the support that you're offering uh, to, to ease up on some of the permits for shell fishermen who have been affected by Brexit at the moment impact on your budget significantly? Um, the, the overall, um, the repayments that we've made to uh, those fishermen are around £50 per dredge. So some fishermen have met one dredge. I think the maximum dredge is somebody would have would be about three. So it is in sort of de minimis in relation to the, the expenditure. And we felt that it was um, it was a, an appropriate thing to do under the circumstances. I think the overall expenditure was about £2,000 to cover about 35 men. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate what you did to help them. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, very much. Could you put your hand down, Jeff, please? <laughs> Any other questions? If so, I'll hand over to Emma for the um, proposal. Thank you, Chairman. Um, is there a proposal for the recommendations set out in the report? Uh, Jeff Brown, happy to propose. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, and do we have a seconder, please? Oh, Councillor Kasmarek seconding. Thank yeah, you. I'm happy to second it, Emma. It's confusing because it, I'm using raised hands but on, on the literature we got, so it's put across in the uh, tick box. I always yeah. find the raised in hand easier, and I think so does the chairman. Yeah. Right. So I think so. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. Mark. Thank you. So uh, the recommendation is that the 2020-2021 budget monitoring and reserves position for April 2020 to January 2021, as shown at Appendix 1 and 2, is noted and agreed. Um, this has been proposed by Councillor Brown and seconded by Councillor Kazmarek. Uh, I'll now call our committee members' names in turn. Uh, please, will you confirm your name and advise whether you vote in favour or against the recommendation or whether you wish to abstain from the vote. I'll then count the votes and advise of the results. Uh, Councillor Brown. Uh, Jeff Brown, four. Thank you. Uh, Victoria Hogg. Uh, sorry, Councillor Code. <laughs> uh, yes, Graham Code, four. Thank you. Uh, Victoria Hobson. Victoria Hobson, four. Thank you. Councillor Kasmarek. Four, four. Thank you. Councillor Knightley. Councillor Knightley, four. Thank you. Carly Elson. Carly Elson, four. Thank you. Thank you to McNair. <coughs> Thank you to McNair in favour. Thank you. Celia Mitchell. Four. Thank you. John Mundy. John Mundy in favour. Thank you. Councillor Musto. Um, I'm going to have to abstain because I've only just uh, recovered connection properly and I didn't hear all of the uh, presentation. Oh, thank you, Councillor Musto. Uh, Tony Tomlinson. Four. Simon Toms. Four. Nick Dragenza. Four. Ruth Williams. Four. Thank you. That's 13 in favour with one abstention, so that's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, right, if we can go on to item six on your agenda, uh, the annual plan. Um, Sam, would you like to take this? Yes, thank you. Apologies from um, Ben, who wrote the paper and who usually does this. He's not able to, to be with us today. So um, at this time every year, we bring the excerpts of the uh, forthcoming annual plan to you in draft. Uh, these are the focus and priorities and they sort of set out the, um, the sort of direction of travel for the authority for the next year. Um, and the reason we do this is it's important that members have the opportunity to scrutinise and comment um, and if you need to or wish to amend those priorities. Um, what the annual plan doesn't 
include is the kind of day-to-day -day business that um, the sort of ongoing bits of work, bits of work, the ongoing <laughs> workload that we have. So um, research, enforcement, admin, um, policy work. So that's taken as read. The focus and priorities are about new projects or new pieces of work that stand out. So I would draw your attention um, to the appendix, which is on page 23 of um, your papers. So after after last year's um, plan being written, just as we uh, went down into um, the first lockdown, because our meeting was literally just before, um, I don't suppose we imagined that we would still be in this situation of uh, being in another lockdown, writing another annual plan. So understandably, some of the things that we thought we were going to do last year, we didn't do. So those have been brought forwards. Um, but I think one of the one of the main threads for the coming year, both at an IFCA level, but also at a national level, will be the start of the process to uh, deliver fisheries management plans, which form a major part of the um, implementation of the Fisheries Act. So the focus and priorities have been split down into a number of areas. Um, so bylaw development and review, firstly, the Salmolid um, protection bylaw. Uh, we will be carrying that process through to um, formal consultation uh, later this year, hopefully at the, the June meeting. Um, the impact assessment there has taken a little bit longer, so uh, I think we'd originally uh, thought we might come to this meeting for making that bylaw. So that continues. Uh, Fowl fishery um, review, the regulating order as the grantee of the regulating order. We have to uh, constantly review the management of the fishery. And it was, again, that was a piece of work that we were going to do last year. So um, we'll be looking at that this year. And the other bylaw area will be around the uh, closed areas European Marine Science Bylaw, which is um, up for review at the moment. As I said, fisheries management plans. So um, we have an undertaking to start the net fisheries management plan um, and the Salmonid Bylaw and other work on bass sort of feeds into that. However, we it, we understand and recognise that we've got some massive gaps in data in relation to netting activities. So one of the main challenges there will be to try and identify these data gaps and find solutions to gathering that data. Um, and that relates to um, information I think we spoke about before with regards to the MMO's data sharing agreement with us, but also whether we need to gather our own data ourselves. Um, and work on bass is sort of woven into that particular work stream. The crustacean fisheries management plan, there will be a draft of that um, due very shortly in the new financial year. Um, great deal of effort and work has gone into that. And as part of that, we will also be looking at potential management options for crawfish. Something else that uh, came across from last year and what we hoped to do last year was to start looking at um, scallop fisheries. It's a, you know, it's a significant and high value fishery within Cornwall. And um, we wanted to start doing work on uh, scallop baseline survey work. That's been quite tricky in relation to the COVID restrictions and the way in which Tiger Lily has been able to operate. Um, but moving forwards, we're optimistic that we'll be able to start that work this year. Um, and the any work on scalloping will also bring into scope um, connections with the closed areas bylaw that we referred to earlier. And of course, it's really important to start um, working with owners and skippers of scallop vessels and their representatives to to establish a you know two-way dialogue to to really inform the development of this management plan. And finally, um, what we try to do also is build in a bit of resilience and capacity to deal with uh, the types of change that um, we may see this year. It's a fast moving subject, both at a national level with respect to the development of inshore fisheries management, the fisheries management plans nationally that we refer to. And of course, all of this is overlain then with um, the four step process that we're all uh, part of with respect to coming out of the COVID restrictions. So 
you put your best endeavours down um, as part of a plan and hope that the uh, restrictions will enable you to um, carry out your work as you intended. I'm very happy to take any questions and I can just see that my battery is running low, so I better switch that on a second if you bear with me. OK, Nick, Nick, I think you've uh, got a cross in your box. Yes, um, I mean, the, there's something I think we should add under high level um, objective three, which is the carbon issue. I mean, I think a lot of members will have heard the report of a paper in Nature which estimates the carbon footprint of global bottom trawling as about the same as global aviation, which is staggering, but it does make sense. You know, all those fossil fuels or nearly all of them got there through going through the surface layers of the seabed and trawling, bottom trawling disturbs that. So it has a lot of implications for the issues that the chief officer was mentioning in relation to um, scallop fisheries. And I think we should in this year start a conversation with stakeholders and thinking, you know, within the, the authority itself about the huge implications of this. You know, if COVID and Brexit weren't enough, this one is even bigger. So uh, I'd be interested to hear what other other uh, members think about that. Right, um, Sam, I, I'll add something to it. Uh, Sam, would you like to answer that first? Yeah, it's something we did think about when we were writing this and it it's trying to such a huge scale in terms of the, the subject and it, you know it overlies all our all our worlds doesn't it um, and it's trying to think at what's our entry point into that into developing that conversation and how we can materially make a difference. Um, I shared a, a paper um, an article from Fishing News with some of our uh, staff recently that talked about um, potential new types of propulsion within the fishing industry and of course we would have to consider um, moving forwards when we renew our vessels about how you know just as an organization we we deal with those challenges but the wider challenges um, for the fishing industry um, well yeah it's a it's a massive subject Nick so I agree with you it's trying to work out how we can meaningfully start to address that with the limited resources and the limited staff that we have um, at our disposal. OK, next question, uh, Ruth. I think, are you commenting on that? Yeah, commenting on the um, on the same issue, really. And I totally agree with with Sam's comments. It is a massive thing and we've got very limited resources. But I don't think that that's that's the reason for not including it, at least mentioning it. And I think because it's so much of our work going forward um, needs to consider the impact on the carbon cycle and climate mitigation and reducing our own carbon footprint and emissions, it needs to be at least mentioned. Um, I noticed at the very beginning the, um, the National IFCA vision hasn't been updated yet. And I'd like to hope that when that does happen, um, there will be a mention of climate uh, change and how they're going to address that in that section. But for now, I think, you know, even if under success criterion three in the definition, it already says it should make a contribution to sustainable development, full stop. I think we could include, you know, comma there and just include, you know, contribution and, and discussion around reduction of carbon emissions and climate change mitigation, as well as that sustainable development. And at least then it's in there and um, shows that we're considering, it, you know, it, it doesn't say that we have to take action and that's our immediate priority for every decision, but we have to consider it. And I think just having those words in there makes, makes a strong point. OK, thank you, Ruth. Uh, Sangeeta. Thank, thanks, Tony. Hi, Sam. Um, I just um, wanted to um, agree with Nick and Ruth's um, points that they've made. But also I had a question before Nick spoke, which was about um, the fisheries management plans and just the importance of implement, implementing them in order to um, help achieve the objectives of the um, 
of the Fisheries Act and it was just relating back to the resource. And it, my question was, are, are we confident that, that we have enough staff resource to take the fisheries management plans forward, plus the addition of Nick and Ruth's comments just now? Um, Simon Toms, my environment agency colleague and myself as natural England rep, we're both members of Devon and Seven Ifka and yesterday the committee approved a two year fixed term appointment paid from reserves to progress fisheries management plans and I just wanted to just in, ensure with you know always when members ask for additional um, work or additional things to be included in the action plan it, it comes back to officers being able to do that and I just um, wanted to um, find out if and um, how confident we were that we, we were able to, to do that and if, if the committee could help in any way by um, yeah, that, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question and I was aware that they were they were doing that. Um, I suppose by illustration um, to answer that we took on um, a fixed term appointment to write the crustacean fisheries management plan. So we didn't have sufficient resource within Cole's team, within the scientific team. So we actually did take somebody on as a fixed term appointment using some underspend that we had because of the ways in which the um, <clears throat> people's hours had changed. So I think moving forward, it is going to be a challenge um, with respect to finding those resources. Uh, these are complex pieces of work and um, they are going to take a lot of time because they're you know fairly resource heavy in terms of gathering data. Um, there's always the option of, of looking at our reserves to um, fill that gap and to look at fixed term appointments. We also have to be aware that those reserves are also there to replace vessels as well um, and that is also becoming an increasingly pressing need. Um, say in the next sort of two to five years, we know we really have to come up with some solutions. So it is a really good question and it's challenging. It's challenging work. Um, there's a lot of it. And we're also trying to understand how those fisheries management plans then will link in to the aspirations of um, both the devolved administrations, UK as a whole, and any of the devolved administrations as to how national management plans might then meet with um, ours. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. OK, thank you, Sangi. Uh, Nick, Sam, you wish to uh, ask another one question? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the carbon issue, you know, obviously interacts with the, the uh, staff resources issue, but I don't think it's all kind of too big for us. There are issues that are definitely within our scope. And I, I would like to propose that if, if this is appropriate, that um, we add uh, an item uh, to to the, um, the plan of, uh, I don't know, quite I'd need help here scoping out this issue or, um, you know, beginning to evaluate it because there's a lot to be done here. We've got to get started on it. I'm not suggesting we come up with anyth anything remotely concrete at this point, but it's just bringing the issue on onto our agenda and into our evaluation of all these other issues. Yeah, I have no doubt that Sam, you'd like to. Um, what, what we can do is put that in as a line in um, this sort of additional work stream section on the back, bottom of page 26, but I, I would urge um, some to, uh, some caution in terms of the amount of details that we can we can achieve on that in this first year, but I'm happy to put something in into into a line in there, Nick. Yeah, which okay. reflects I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. I mean, I, I, I totally understand your caution here that that you, you can see an avalanche of work uh, dumping on the work program and uh, disrupting it. But um, yeah, so uh, if do we do we have to do anything more formal to get that change? I've, I've um, made some notes. So um, the whole purpose of having the discussion um, at, at the authority is that you know those suggestions can be incorporated. So what I'll do is I'll um, ensure that Ben has that um, 
to insert into the, the focus and priorities and we'll make sure there's a line in there that reflects looking at these issues at a you know at a very broad level but i would um urge caution as to what you um what we can achieve within this year on that subject but you know i, I hear what you're saying and uh, i think it's appropriate to put it in there okay and it, and it is minuted so uh, it, it certainly won't get lost uh, mark next Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I think it's important because um, what we have on our pages here is focus and priorities for 2021-2022. And after years of being on the, the sea fishers and the Ipa now, uh, these priorities can get diluted. So I think it's very important that we concentrate on getting these, um, these priorities done and we actually do focus on them. Uh, but what does worry me is the additional work streams and uh, and we've seen the aftermath of what's happening in Europe and the impact it's having on the fishery. But also we have the issue of, um, I, I, I don't know if it's uh, been official yet, but are the bluefish, bluefin tuna being allowed to be caught and tagged now? Boy, um, has that come in? Because that, that, that was being pushed for for quite a while. But that's an encouraging sign to see these bluefin tuna around Cornwall and have they been brought in by the, the huge shoals of um, pilchards that uh, we've been seeing and, and if that fishery is exploited will that impact on the bluefish bluefin tuna so there, there's lots of additional work streams that could be coming on and will be coming on but I think it's very important we stay focused on, on what we got there uh, for officers to do otherwise it'll be too thinly spread so um yeah, it's just common really. Thank you, Mark. OK, any further questions? Otherwise, I will hand across um, for Emma to get um, proposals to accept the annual plan. Excellent. OK, Emma. Thank you, Chairman. Um, could you please indicate, oh, I beg your pardon, <laughs> I'm reading the wrong section. Um, the recommendation is that the committee consider the proposed focus and priorities section and work plan for the forthcoming year in Appendix 1, and the committee approves this draft as, as the basis for the 2021-22 annual plan. Um, is there a proposer for the recommendations, please? Uh, Ruth Williams has proposed those recommendations. Can I just um, clarify? Sorry, Emma. Um, yep. It that's what as you've read it out just says it's the draft as as it stands, but that doesn't include the additions that that Nick and Sam have just discussed. Um, if I add some words that the, that the committee approves the draft, um, including the issues raised at this meeting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. I'm happy with that at this meeting. OK, so that'll be that the committee approves this draft, including the issues raised at this meeting as the basis for the 2021-22 annual plan. Great. OK, thank you. And, and you're happy to propose that? I am, yes. Lovely, thanks. Could I have a seconder, please? Yes, seconded. Nick Draganza. Thank you, Nick Draganza. Lovely. Um, I'll now call out committee members' names in turn. Uh, please will you confirm your name and advise whether you vote in favour or against the recommendation or whether you wish to abstain from the vote. I'll then count the votes and advise the result. Uh, Councillor Brown. Uh, Jeff Brown, four. Thank you. Councillor Code. Graham Code, four. Thank you. Victoria Hobson. Victoria Hobson in favour. Thank you. Councillor Kazmarek. Four. Thank you. Councillor Knightley. Councillor Knightley, four. Thank you. Carly Elson. Carly Elson, four. Thank you. Sangeeta McNair. Sangeeta McNair, in favour. Thank you. Celia Mitchell. Four. Thank you. John Mundy. John Mundy, in favour. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Councillor Musto. Four. Yeah. Thank you. Tony Tomlinson. Four. Thank you. Simon Toms. Four. Thank you. Nick Tregenza. Four. Thank you. And Ruth Williams. Four. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. That's been carried unanimously. Thank you, Emma. Um, takes us on to item seven, the vital working 
uh, group update. Sam again. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry about this. Um, right, so this is um, as with our last meeting um, update from the most recent bylaw working group that we had and its uh, recommendations is to note the contents of the report. So we had a number of discussions um, at bylaw working group. Um, first of which was around the fixed and drift net salmon protection bylaw. Um, so re officers reported back to uh, members on the outcomes of the informal consultation process that had been held um, sort of over the Christmas and New Year period, of which we had 50 written responses um, to that consultation. Um, and uh, as expected, those responses were um, on the whole from um, commercial fishing industry in relation to the impact that those um, measures could have on them, as well as from sort of recreational angling sector as well. Um, so the paper sort of sets out some of the um, the responses that we had, and I don't think any of those would come as a, as a surprise to members having discussed this uh, proposed by law for often many years. Um, Members of Bylaw Working Group also considered the first draft of the regulatory impact assessment, which, as you'll remember, is the document that sits alongside um, the bylaw when it finally goes to for consideration by um, DEFRA. And we have still some gaps to fill within that regulatory impact assessment. And again, that sort of weaves back to, in fact, our public question um, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, with respect to about two of our public questions around data um, on landings and species. So there's still some work to be done. And as a result, this is why there's some delay with the regulatory impact assessment and getting that completed. Um, one of the challenges uh, that we talked about with Bylaw Working Group members is around how you quantify um, an economic impact um, and an economic benefit. And it is always a challenge for us. We don't have economists working here. It's it's Colin, Simon and I trying to um, to gather that data or draw it out from the responses we've had in formal consultations. So Bala Working Group members discussed these, um, the data that we'd had so far and the kind of responses that we had regards both costs and benefits. And those feel, those fit into the overall regulatory impact assessment. So there's still some work to be done there um, and we'll be taking that back to the next bylaw working group meeting. We then went on to talk about um, the live RAS fishery, which we managed through a limited permit system with five permits. And um, I will ask Colin in a minute to update us slightly on the, the, um, the situation. At the time of the meeting, there, were, there was a concern that um, three of those permits, if all taken up, could be within the Plymouth Sound area, um, which would potentially concentrate a lot of fishing effort in that area. So because the fish, because the um, RAS permit is a sort of flexible permit by law, it enables us to bring in permit conditions if we need it, um, unlike a, a sort of standard by law. So on page 46, those permit conditions that we thought we may need are listed there. Um, I'm just going to ask Cole if you can comment briefly on um, what's changed since that point, because uh, at that juncture, we thought we were going to have three out of the five um, permits within Plymouth Sound. I don't know if you can comment further on that, Cole. Uh, currently, we've still only had the one application to operate in that area. So possibly we won't need to implement those, I don't think at the moment. Um, uh, also, we would probably be looking at one more permit from my understanding, uh, one more permit application for that area. So, so we may not, you know, we may, um, <coughs> may not need to say in, implement those. Thank you. Um, we then went on to discuss with members um, the issues around um, bass management and sort of scoping out uh, what we know about bass landings, bass fishing um, and the data gaps that we identify um, in our current sort of data holdings. 
So we felt this is really important. Um, we've written quite a few reports in the last uh, year regarding VAS um, in response to questions put to us um, from outside of the committee. So we thought it was important that we needed to bring together what relevant information that we have um, in terms of Cornwall specific information and use that scoping work to sort of feed into the netting management plan. So the aim is to have a sort of scoping paper to our next bylaw working group in May. And finally, members discussed, um, asked questions and discussed um, a verbal update on remote tracking devices. Um, Colin's been trying, trialing a vessel vehicle tracking device, but using it on a vessel. So this is a, a bit of a departure. So members were interested as to how that had been working. So he reported back on that. Um, as you can see from um, the information on page 47, it's uh, uh, very, you know, relatively affordable in relation to other devices that we've discussed previously. So um, the outcomes and outputs are the bottom of um, page 47 and Colin, as you just heard, has sort of updated us on what's happening potentially with the RAS. So I think at this stage we may not need to um, invoke new permit conditions. Um, very happy to take any questions um, or any comments maybe from bylaw working group members who are there. Simon. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, just a few comments on the uh, migratory salmonid bottle. Um, the first point was around uh, provision of evidence, and I think it's fair to say the Environment Agency has already given considerable evidence to the IFCA since 2016, um, setting out the measures that are required to protect salmon and certainly a lot of the background information that was used to develop the historic bylaw in 1987. Um, we've also got some additional data relating to the GWC team, Game Wildlife Conservancy Trust studies that have been undertaken around the Cornish coast. Um, especially around the, the bycatch in some of the netting trials that have been undertaken. Um, the other thing that we've offered is to actually support the regulatory um, impact assessment with any detail that we can add to that, which we offered in the previous bylaw working group meeting. That isn't recorded in the minutes, so if that could be recorded, that would be good. Um, and the final thing to say within the uh, section four is around you refer to many commercial fishermen, but it doesn't actually state how many, so it would be useful to have the detail around that. And I think it would also be fair to say that in the bylaw working group meeting, we bylaw working group members also requested more detailed information around the losses that were suggested by Medigizzi, because that was a very generic uh, sum of money that was discussed, and I don't actually think by law working group members actually saw the detail that's suggested in these notes. So that would be really useful to see. So thank you. So. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Simon. Um, in the bylaw working group meeting, you did very kindly offer to provide some additional information to us um, on, I think, on rod licenses, which um, I don't, uh, you may have sent it, but I don't have a record of it. So maybe that would be helpful if you could to send that over but yes noted in terms of the other information that you've um, already provided um, yes the, there may have been a bit of a communication issue there because i thought you were going to send me a copy of the uh, impact assessment i would add to various sections for you on that um, we have a lot of socio-economic data on some audits that we can add into this bylaw and some of the statutory drivers that may be useful to help support the regulatory impact assessment as well. So should we take that offline and uh, so. I'll give you a call early next week and uh, discuss the details. So it sounds That's like great. we might have been talking at cross purposes I there. I think so, yeah. Um, on your point about um, uh, more detailed information and providing that to bylaw working group members, I put in a Data Protection Act request to the MMO um, because 
although we've got the data sharing agreement signed, it's still not operational. So I still have to do a data protection act. So that data actually turned up a couple of days ago. So we're looking at it at the moment. So we will be able to report to Barlow Working Group with yeah. uh, some more detail based upon that. So yes. hopefully that will be helpful. Thanks, Sam. I've, I've also obtained some information through another group as well, and uh, it'll be interesting to compare and contrast that with you when you receive that through the final working group. OK. Thank you. Uh, John Monday. Thank you, Chairman. We, we had a very long bylaw working group meeting. Um, much of the time was spent on the Salmonid bylaw. One of the things I've asked Simon to supply to it, Sam was historic data on, on the Salmonid catch over years going back as far as possible. So possibly we could see the effect of gill nets on the decreased catches of of salmoiders and, and to see if this has really had the effect that we that people are suggesting it has. Yeah. yeah, that's fine, John. We can do that. No problem. OK, thank you. Any further? Celia. Yes, uh, just about that, you may see a decreased catch in salmoids, but that is not due to commercial fishermen. And I'm going to send some more scientific data to the IFTA before um, the next final working committee. Um, and just like to say that from de December the 23rd, when the market shut this year through till now, poor weather, poor prices, Brexit, lockdown effect and everything has meant fishing activity is very low in shore and increasingly windy weather means that there is less fishing and increases the need for access to the sheltered bays. And when we talk about decreased catch and relating it to commercial fishing, I've already sent um, a news report to IFCA about river pollution. And we've been saying all along, it's not the commercial fishermen, it's due to river pollution. And to now the BBC News on the 23rd of February um, had an article, Extinction Freshwater Fish in Catastrophic Decline, Nearly a Third Threatened with Extinction. And according to the WWF, much of the decline is driven by the poor state of rivers. In the UK, it said, wildlife struggles to survive, let alone thrive in our polluted rivers. WWF's chief advisor on freshwater fish said that. So I think the EA um, need to concentrate on the pollution in rivers, whereby the salmon that go up to breed, the small stuff doesn't get back out into the sea. And I think that is what is contributing to the decline in salmonids. And CFAS have updated their figures, which I should also be sending to IFCA in Area 7. And there's nothing for from 2018 to 20. 20, no salmonids have been caught in Area 7 and they're observing constantly on the boats. That's all I'm going to say. OK, uh, thank you. Simon? Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that there's been a much reduced level of effort this year, uh, Celia, because we've actually seen an increase in the number of sea trout returning to rivers this year, actually. <laughs> so that, that would seem to be an interesting observation in itself. Um, the other thing I would say is we're very fortunate in, in the southwest to have some of the cleanest rivers in the country, actually. And what we're actually seeing is that juvenile densities of trout, particularly, um, are actually as good as they've ever been. So the issue is about adult fish returning back to rivers, not about the number of juveniles going out to sea. Um, it's not to say that commercial fishing is having all of the impact on migratory salmon, it's especially salmon because there's such a there's many other issues involved there as well. But the reality is that commercial fishing, if you're setting nets in inshore coastal waters, it's inevitable that some of those fish will be caught. And we have evidence that that, that is happening, even though some people are suggesting they, they don't do that. But uh, anyway, we can have that discussion at a later date through Bylaw Working Group. OK, thank you. 
Thank you. OK, um, Sam, do you wish to carry on with the paper? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't really think I've got anything else to add, actually. Um, I, I can see that Ruth has a question, however. Right. Hi there. Um, it was just on the update on remote tracking devices. Um, <laughs> I think I've asked this many, many times <laughs> over the course of the years. Have we got any news from MMO about the national legislation or progress on that we're still waiting on? Chairman, I'll hand this over to Simon because this is uh, a subject he's more familiar with than me. Simon. Simon. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, I covered it very, very briefly in my report as well in the chief officer's report, my part of the chief officer's report. It comes up there as well. Um, yeah, it's it's it is incredibly slow progress with um, inshore vessel monitoring systems. Um, so, you know, we are still hopeful as an IFCA and all IFCAs want a solution to this. We are hopeful that the MMO will develop one. We've been saying this, I know, for years, possibly about eight years now. Um, and it is really important that we have this um, inshore vessel monitoring system solution. Um, but as far as the legislation goes, we've yet to see any draft of it. We don't know quite we haven't got anything formal from the MMO in terms of how they um, see the system um, finally in operation, but we do know that they are working, if we like, earnestly on the matter. And you know, it is um, it's just just it's not going as quickly as we'd like. But um, you know, there's no doubt that the MMO are keen to see it introduced. But it, the ball is in their court. I can't really say much more than that. Okay, thank you, Simon. <laughs> If you could remove yourself from the screen. Thank you. Uh, right. Yeah, if I could just add on a national level, um, the association of, of IFCA is, is working hard on this uh, and um, hopefully might help unblock the uh, levels of um, effort that go on with it. But um, it has gone on a ridiculous number of years for uh, what is technologically uh, changing all the time. OK, uh, Emma, can I hand this over to you, please, uh, now to call a vote on um, noting the report? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the recommendation in this report is that members note the contents of the report. So uh, could I have a proposal, please? Graham Code, I propose. Thank you, Councillor Code. And is there a seconder, please? Happy to second, Jeff Brown. Thank you, Councillor Brown. OK, so yeah, the uh, recommendation is members note the contents of the report, which has been proposed by Councillor Code and seconded by Councillor Brown. Uh, I'll now call out committee members' names in turn. Please will you confirm your name and advise whether you vote in favour or against the recommendation or whether you wish to abstain from the vote. And I'll then count the votes and advise of the result. So Councillor Brown, please. Uh, Jeff Brown, four. Thank you. Councillor Code. Graham Code, four. Thank you. Victoria Hobson. Victoria Hobson, four. Thank you. Councillor Kazmarek. Four. Thank you. Councillor Knightley. Councillor Knightley, four. Thank you. Carly Elson. Carly Elson, four. Thank you. Sangeeta McNair. Sangeeta McNair, in favour. Thank you. Celia Mitchell. Four. Thank you. John Mundy. John Mundy, in favour. Thank you. Councillor Musto. Four. Thank you. Tony Tomlinson. Four. Thank you. Simon Toms. Four. Thank you. Nick Tregenza. Four. Thank you. And Ruth Williams. Four. Thank you. That's carried unanimously, Chairman. OK, uh, thank you for that, Emma. Right, on to item eight. Um, Sam, yet again, your Chief Officer's report, please. Thank you, Tony. Um, so firstly, on page 51, um, and echoing everything that Tony said earlier about Mr Muirhead, um, David, we all miss him very much here as officers and we all miss his generosity and his kindness to us and um, his enthusiasm for everything that we did and his interest in everything that uh, we did here, both as a Sea Fisheries Committee and as an IFCA. 
And I wonder, Chairman, if you're happy, um, would any other members wish to, to, to make mention of, of David and um, say anything at this point? Um, you've all worked with him in some cases for decades, and I wonder whether you wanted the, the opportunity to do that. Yes, I'm, any anyone is welcome to uh, say uh, their piece if they wish. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to endorse what you said, Tony, and and uh, what what Sam has said. Yeah, he was uh, he was an amazing combination of lawyer and fisherman. Um, yeah, sorry to lose him. Yeah, thank you for that, Nick. Mark. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I think David was one of those people that I don't think he had a bad bone in his his body and everyone looked at as a friend, uh, really good drinking partner, um, reasonable rugby player, but um, but now he, he he was a character and um, and he will be missed because everyone who knew him uh, had a great deal of respect for him and, and you know he, he will be missed. Thank you. Graham. I think Jeff Brown's got his hand up, Jeff. Uh, right, I've, I've got Graham Cohn's hand up here. Jeff, if you want to. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think like you, I first came across David back in the 70s and when we were mackerel fishing in the winters down at uh, uh, sunny Falmouth, uh, much different to the stormy uh, Newquay coastline in the winter. Um, David is always impressed as a very level-headed, very calm, but absolutely committed uh, person to inshore fishing, particularly under 10 fleet and shell fishing especially, and I'm sure that everybody will miss him greatly. Um, I've served with him since 2009 on uh, Cornwall Sea Fisheries, Cornwall IFCA, and it's always been a pleasure to join him at meetings. Thank you, Joe. Any others? Okay, Sam. Thank you all very much for that. Um, yeah, rest in peace, David. Um, moving on to to other changes. Um, as we uh, spoke earlier, as the chairman mentioned, we're we're saying goodbye to to a lot of members and hopefully hello to some new ones fairly shortly. So um, waiting here to hear the outcome of the uh, recent interviews conducted by the MMO. Um, for new membership, uh, but also um, by the time we get to our June meeting, there will have been a, um, a council election as well. So there may be changes relating to that as the uh, the amount of councillors is going to decrease by about 34 councillors. So uh, our meeting in June and our roll call might be quite different. Um, and also on a, on a note for as, as, as officers, we say goodbye to Nigel Bezweatherick, who's um, one of our very popular uh, enforcement officers. Um, he's now retired, lucky man, um, and uh, probably fitter than the rest of us as well. So he's got that great combination of uh, a lot of energy and a lot of time. So uh, yeah, we, we miss him already. Um, moving forwards, um, Rest of page 52, uh, since we last spoke, the trade and cooperation agreement was signed finally, and um, we're now experiencing some of the outcomes of, of that. Um, and you know, I won't labour that point. There's been an, an awful lot in the press um, regarding initial difficulties or ongoing difficulties, particularly in re relation to the export of animal products, including fish and seafood um, from all over the country. So in recognition of that, the um, DEFRA had brought in um, funding packages to help compensate for losses and those funding packages have more recently been expanded to enable um, greater access from the catching sector. Um, and Cornwall Council has also been active in identifying and signposting other funding streams that might be um, useful for um, people within the fishing industry. Um, both recreational and commercial and surrounding industries that uh, have been affected. Um, in Colin's report in a little bit, um, he will talk more detail about the specific impacts of the trade and cooperation agreement and um, the transition, leaving with, 
leaving the EU with relation to live bivalve mollusks. And finally, sort of on that note, um, the normal EU um, fisheries negotiations that are normally concluded around Christmas time, we report on them usually at December meeting. Those weren't um, completed because of the trade and cooperation agreement. So those have rolled over with some provisional quota allocations for the first quarter of this year. Um, those those provisional allocations finish on the 31st of um, March. So time is of the essence. Uh, the North Sea trilateral agreement has, was signed a couple of days ago, a few days ago between Norway, the EU and UK for some of the sort of key North Sea stocks like cod and haddock. But the rest of the um, the rest of the negotiations, I think, are in their fifth round at the moment. So um, ongoing and very complicated and will obviously have an impact on us all. So I don't know if members got any questions there. If not, I'll hand over to Simon for page 54. No questions for anyone. OK, thank you. Simon. Thank you, Sam. Yes, um, thank you. So moving on to page 54. Um, my normal uh, table of events. Um, it looks like we're going to be seeing the, the first uh, couple of lines there, if you like, the first couple of lines of boxes, if you like, there for quite some time, uh, well into 2022, I suggest, um, with the way the court system is choked up. Um, and so, you know, this is now going to be taking this into like four years worth of work, um, which is quite unprecedented. Um, then coming further down that table, I can just up you date you on page 55, uh, 2006, where we offered a financial administrative um, penalty there. That has not been paid, so we're now moving forward with prosecution on that uh, through the magistrates uh, this year. Um, going on down the page to the team um, on page 55 still. Yeah, as Sam mentioned, you know, very sad to see Nigel go. But I have a couple more uh, extra officers that we um, uh, uh, picked up last year who are in training or on parental leave at the moment, but also looking forward to seeing our senior enforcement officer coming back next week uh, to take on the day to day management and pick up on various work streams with the team when she gets there. The other uh, uh, person away on parental leave should be back with us in June, so we'll be you know, getting back towards um, a much better strength um, in the enforcement team by the by the summer and, and let's hope that the, um, you know, the COVID restrictions um, give us more scope for uh, doing patrol work. Um, <clears throat> we've already touched on, coming over now onto page 56, um, we have already touched on the inshore vessel monitoring system and hoping that that will move forward uh, to some kind of resolution this year. Uh, any comments um, on that? Um, have to take them now. OK, Jeff, first. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. And just first of all, picking up on uh, Sam's uh, comments about the elections. Um, it's been my privilege to work with colleagues and officers for the last 12 years, and we don't know what's going to happen the other side of May. But uh, um, but in those 12 years, I previously worked with Eddie Derriman, who was the uh, long established chief fisheries officer. I think he was in charge when Noah was at sea fishing. Um, but it was my privilege when I was vice chair of uh, IFCA to be part of the uh, panel that appointed Sam uh, to chief officer and she's proved to be highly professional and uh, approached everything in a very calm measured way and we definitely made the right choice. So that was just a comment on that. The question is on page 54 uh, to Simon. I just assume that because these matters have gone to Crown Court, that's because of the severity of the offences. Yes, indeed, uh, Jeff. Uh, we have um, basically money laundering offences there. They have to go into the Crown Court. It can't be heard by magistrates. Far too serious. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Sangeeta. Thank you, Chair. Um, Simon, it was just a question on the case you raised on 2006. And it's not about the case because I know you're not allowed to comment on it, but it's just if we're taking them for if it's being taken forward to prosecution, uh, uh, is the individual still able to apply for a permit for a new fishing season while that's ongoing? I guess it could be answered in respect to any any one ongoing prosecution, if that's helpful. I just wanted to, if you could clarify that, please. Yes, yeah, certainly, that's not a problem. Um, okay, so uh, as, as we all know, everyone's innocent until proven guilty. 
Um, so uh, at, the, at this point in time, um, if the person um, had a permit or applied for a permit, um, that would be OK in terms of we could issue one or we could keep it, leave it rem remain issued. I, I, I don't want to, I've got to be a bit careful here because I, I don't want to um, um, divulge too much here. But um, at the point is, if we have a successful prosecution now, um, then the permit will be withdrawn for the remainder of 2021. That is a condition under the RAS per, live RAS permit bylaw, whereby we can remain, remove a permit for the year in which you commit the offence and the following year. Well, this is the following year because it is an offence relating to last year. So um, you, that's, that's what would, would happen if we secure a, a conviction on that. Thanks for clarifying. OK, thank you. Any other questions for Simon? OK, thank you, Simon. Um, Colin, you want to take over on your section? Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, I think I'll just start off. I'd like to say sort of a big thank you to my team who've now been working at home for exactly a year. And, you know, with all the uh, difficulties of working at home with children and, you know, just the general difficulties of uh, not being able to differentiate home life from work life when you're, you know, uh, full on like that, um, they performed amazingly well. And, uh, and then, you know, we wouldn't have had the output without them working in that way. Um, I think uh, in some way I'll go through my usual way. If anybody's got any questions by, by the pages, perhaps uh, throw them up through the chair. Uh, so, page 56, uh, 57, 58. Ruth. Thanks, Joan. Um, Colin, it was right at the very bottom of page 58 uh, where you're talking about the crustacean fishery management plan and setting up a working group um, of stakeholders. Um, will that be in conjunction with the bylaw working group, or will it just will it be separate um, and used to inform bylaw working group? Um, my my first thoughts on that would be used to inform bylaw working group. Cool. I think I'm going to look through. You know, we, in the plan at the moment is a, a bit of a very good, big range of uh, management options that I would like a you know a working group to discuss, and then the results of those discussions could come to bylaw working group. Great, thank you. Um, in that case, could I suggest that you have a, a chat to Matt Slater and um, see if he can join in because he's obviously involved with the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide and has got a lot of information from various shell fishermen on, on this. So I think it would be a valuable asset to that, that working group. Lovely. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. That's noted. Thanks. Um, OK, uh, carrying on uh, page 59. Sangeetas uh, there first. Oh, sorry, Colin. Sorry, Carl, I just got a question following on from Ruth's and um, it's to do with the fisheries management plans. And I probably should have mentioned it in um, it when we were talking about bass in, in the previous agenda item, but it's relevant because it's research. And it's just highlighting that at, um, at yesterday's Devon and Seven IFCA meeting, there was a presentation by um, Tom Stamp, um, Dr. Tom Stamp on his PhD and he was um, tracking European bass and it was just to ensure that um, yourselves and the bio working group were were, were aware of his work because he, he found some um, really good what um, well he, he's, he's done some really good research and he's got some really excellent evidence over over his um, study period and then some recommendations so I, I just wanted to highlight highlight that to um, the research team and, and to the final working group. Yeah lovely thanks Angus. yeah no we I, I have been in touch with Thomas about oh, that, that project and and the wider project that they're about that team are about to embark on. So, but thanks anyway. Thank you. Great, thank you. Right, okay, Colin. Uh, so, so page 59, uh, 60, 61 and oh, uh, 62. Thank you. Hi, right, thanks, Colin. If there's no further questions, Simon, would you just like to take on uh, Dan's report? I will. I'm going, to, I'm going to follow on in the same uh, format uh, with page uh, 63. Anybody would like to comment on that? Moving forward to 64. And I'll take on uh, the chief engineer's report here. If anybody would like to comment on that, again, continue on page 64 through to page 65. 
OK. Right, thank you for that, Simon. That concludes the report. Now I'll hand over to Emma for um, proposals uh, for the report being noted. Emma. Thank you, Chairman. Um, don't like to um, continue with the report. That the report be noted. Um, so I will. Thank you, pardon. Just finding the right piece of paper. <coughs> so yes, the recommendation is the report be noted. Um, can we have a proposal, please? I got my hand up, Anna. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Sorry, I couldn't see that then. Um, so we have a seconder, please. Uh, Graham Co. That's Graham Co. Thank you, Councillor Co. Lovely. Um, I'll now call out committee members' names in turn. Please confirm your name and advise whether you vote in favour or against the recommendation or whether you wish to abstain. Um, I'll then count the votes and advise of the result. Uh, so, Councillor Brown, please. Uh, Jeff Brown, four. Thank you. Councillor Code. Graham Code, four. Thank you. Victoria Hobson. Victoria Hobson, in favour. Thank you. Councillor Kismarek. Four. Councillor Knightley. Councillor Knightley, four. Thank you. Carly Elson. Carly Elson, four. Thank you. Thank you, McNair. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Celia Mitchell. Four. Thank you. John Monday. John Monday, in favour. Thank you. Councillor Musto. Councillor Musto. Four. Ah, thank you. Uh, Tony Tomlinson. Four. Thank you. Simon Toms. Four. Thank you. Nick Tregenza. Four. Thank you. And Ruth Williams. Four. Thank you, Chairman. That's been carried unanimously. Uh, thank you, Emma. Um, and that concludes item eight. Um, we have no other business under item nine. So it is just for me to thank everyone for their attendance. And given what's been said already about the council elections, uh, my obvious thanks to all of those or any of those or none of those who might not be at our next meeting in June. Um, I thank them sincerely for their, their efforts in the past and look forward to seeing those of us who will be there um, on June, I think it's June the 8th. So uh, thank you everyone again. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. 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 Thank you.